Okay, so I did a load of videos on chemical threats and how to protect yourself from them with each episode going through a different type of agent. Then in the end I had to throw in uh, Cobchok, whatever it was called, uh, Novichok, because, um, you know, obviously that was in the news and I was very sceptical about it. So what I thought would be a good thing to do would be to do a kind of conclusion video on it, and again, I can throw in more videos in this series if people find them interesting enough and want them, you know, if anything's in the news that's interesting. But I thought what would be a good idea would be a video on sort of, um, rather than individual agents, what would be broad things of where chemical threats may become apparent. So where may, where might you be exposed to chemical threats? And again, I'm sure in lots of videos I've touched on this before, but I've not really done a dedicated video on it. So let's sort of go through all the reasons I can think of. So the first reason you might come into contact with a chemical threat might be somebody making a chemical agent by accident or doing some sort of chemical reaction that causes a chemical agent. So this can be anything like people with swimming pools messing up with the chlorine, you know, people mixing chlorine and ammonia, doing stupid things like that, uh, using lots of drain cleaners or something like that, um, you know, pouring them all into their drain in conjunction, causing um, a big cloud of vapour. That's the one people might be exposed to in their own home, not being sensible with, um, you know, household chemicals, causing some sort of chemical reaction that way, making some sort of nasty gas. Uh, generally what happens then is you have to call the fire service who come with their respirators and have to neutralise it for you and I'm sure you get a bit of a telling off and told to read the labels properly. So that's one, but that can happen on a bigger scale. I did see a news report from some hospital somewhere in the UK where they had some sort of therapy swimming pool in the hospital and somebody did exactly that, um, mixed chlorine with something else, I think it might have been ammonia, um, you know, cl causing chloramine or whatever they call it, the not quite chlorine gas. Uh, the impure chlorine gas uh, uh, by you know mixing these chemicals when they were trying to clean the pool or something like that. So that was actually somebody that worked there, nothing terrorist related or anything like that. But you know purely people who don't read labels or you know pay attention to that sort of thing. So I think that's quite likely. Another thing when we talk about non sort of terrorist use or non you know hostile use is simply uh, vehicles transporting chemicals could either crash. You know. Um, or derail if it's a train, that's happened in reality in quite a few places, you know, areas around the trains and things like that, or the trucks where they've crashed have um, had people suffer illnesses and stuff like that due to the chemicals leaking. And touching on something similar to that, you can also have, um, you know, actual chemical plants have fires or chemical plants have a leak. The Bhopal disaster in India, and people have asked me to do a video specifically on Bhopal, so I might do that at some point. But Bhopal um, was basically where there was lots of um, this very nasty chemical, I think it was called something like MIC, and it was something, it was basically as far as I'm aware, a cyanide kind of nerve agent-y kind of, you know, pesticide thing, but it was a pesticide plant basically. Um, and they had all this pesticide stockpiled in the plant, um, and because in India at the time they didn't need very good health and safety rules about how to store it, so... As you can imagine, everything was... D it was an American company, it was Union and Carbide, but it was actually, you know, done... Everything was done as cheap as possible. Um, you know, no safeguards, very few staff trained properly on how the chemicals would react, what to do if the chemicals react. Lots of the safeguards weren't in operation, like the tower where you have the flame to burn off chemicals if they release, you know, pressure valves not working, all this sort of stuff. You'll find, like, with Chernobyl, Chernobyl, with Piper Alpha, all these kind of things, um, when there's a big industrial disaster for whatever reason, generally there's lots of safety things that have gone wrong. It's not one thing, but I'm getting off on a bit of a tangent here. Um, but anyway, they had all this chemical stored underneath um, the MIC, I think is the name of it, um, in tanks under the ground, and basically if water gets into it, it causes a chemical reaction. Somebody was hosing down a lot of the pipes, forgot to put a shut-off valve in place, the water gets into the tank, um, the pressure builds up, and then all this, you know, toxic gas is vented everywhere. All the people panic and stampede. Lots of people killed by, you know, stampeding over, e over each other. Lots of people killed from gas inhalation or gas exposure. Um, you know, and because of all this, um, you know, like, very tragic and horrible, but, you know, I think that is a threat to get back on topic that lots of people could be exposed to if you live near a pesticide plant, some sort of chemical plant, you know, somewhere where um, toxic industrial chemicals are used for whatever reason, if there's a fire or some sort of industrial accident, there could be a leak. Lots of people, you know, are scared of living near nuclear power plants, even though they're relatively safe in comparison, you know, 
in case there's some sort of radiation leak there, Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, you know, Fukushima, any of those. But the same thing can definitely apply to chemical plants. Obviously, if there's a fire or a leak at a chemical plant, that could be very bad for people living nearby. And now, obviously, we need to start touching on uh, actual terrorism and sort of military use of it. So, I, it really wouldn't surprise me if terrorists start trying to use chemical weapons more. We've seen in the Middle East conflicts that chemical weapons are becoming quite prevalent again, you know, used against different people from different sides. Um, obviously, chemical weapons, depending on what type they are, can be easy and hard to manufacture. But we also saw, as I said in other videos, the sarin attack on the Japanese subway system in Tokyo. Luckily that wasn't properly made sarin, um, a bit like what we've had this nerve agent thing in the UK recently. It seems to be not a properly made agent, so what's actually happened is it's made lots of people ill rather than outright killing them. Um, but I think as time goes on, terrorists are probably going to start realising that, you know, making chemical weapons might be a bit easier than making bombs, for example, less detectable, because a lot of these chemicals can be bought over the counter. Obviously in this video I'm not going to tell people how to make some of these things, I am aware of how to make some, a lot of that information is available though, you know, <clears throat> so it's not like um, terrorists aren't aware of it, it's, you know, when when they, you know, when and where they plan it, so I'd rather warn people so you could actually think about owning a respirator or something like that, or being aware of how to react to chemicals rather than, you know, pretending nothing's ever going to happen in that regard. And the other, other thing is obviously state-sponsored kind of stuff and, um, you know, like actual military action. So, as I said, I'm not pointing the finger at anybody with this current UK thing, because we don't know as of yet who's done it, and I don't like to blame Russia until there's evidence that Russia's done it, because Russia, as I said, has been blamed for absolutely everything that goes on, and Ockerman's Razor says that Russia is not to blame, because, you know, what's more likely, that the Russians have a massive conspiracy intelligence network where they interfere with absolutely everything anywhere in the world at once, or that Russia has become an easy scapegoat to use when something else happens. I think the scapegoat option is obviously the more obvious and probable one. But who knows what happened in this scenario. When I, as of when I'm making this video, that's not public information, and I don't know how much I trust the people who'd give this information out. Um, but yeah, you know, you can't rule out that there might be some sort of state-sponsored stuff going on, or military actions where chemical weapons of various types, you know, could lead to people being exposed to it. So as I've said, this is all a video all about the various things that, you know, you could be exposed to. As I've said before, if you think it's sensible for you, find a very compact little respirator you can carry in a bag with you with a filter, and then if anything happens and you're at least aware that an agent's been released, you can at least get a mask on, if nothing else, and flee the scene. Um, I'd always advise keeping a mask at home or in your car at the very least. That way, you know, you're going to be protected. I didn't actually cover in this video as well, but obviously if there's any kind of rioting, riot control agents, pepper sprays, tear agents, you know, CS gas could be used. So that's another thing, but yeah. In general, there is lots of ways you could be exposed to this stuff. Hopefully you won't be, and if you are exposed to something, hopefully it's a very, you know, non-severe thing. And you can be safe and get out of there, but obviously this stuff does happen. So this has been all the video all about, you know, the stuff you could be exposed to, uh, potentially, and how it could come about happening.